Hello, oh, good evening. Up, uh, up you're okay out there. Welcome back to Sussex Wildlife Trust uh, TV. This is our, uh, our, I think, 43rd. I'm not sure who's counting anymore. It's about 40, 43rd webinar. And this is the 12th Nature Table Live. Now, uh, it's, it's a breezy night out there in Sussex. Hopefully you're all strapped down out there because it's going to be uh, even windier tomorrow. But is this all working? Let's have a look. There we are. So here we are. So uh, I'm back from Nature Table Live. And I like, to, uh, this is, uh, I like doing these because I'm not on my own. I'm usually on my own doing these sometimes. But uh, it's nice to know there's people out there. So um, hopefully, hopefully people are out there. Barry? You are there? Hi, Barry. Good evening. Yeah. I'm out here. I'm dressed up for the cold because it's freezing in my office. No, it's really cold. I'll put my, put my warm shirt back on. I'll put the heating back on later on. Yeah. It's like it's probably May the twentieth now. It's ridiculous, ridiculous. Absolutely terrible. Now, what about uh, oh, James? You out there? I'm here. I'm here. James in a t-shirt. Yeah, I'm in a t-shirt. Yeah, yeah. I'm a hardy, hardy individual. <laughs> <laughs> now tonight we uh, we usually uh, we usually do these nature tables every month or so, and tonight we're going to do a special tonight. It's our seaside special. And we're going to be joined uh, by some colleagues of ours from the Wild Coast Sussex Project. So hopefully, uh, hopefully they're out there as well. Uh, Nikki? Hello. Evening. Hi, Nikki. You're up. You uh, not too cold? Uh, I mean, I have got a hoodie on, but I'm okay. Yeah, yeah. It's like that, isn't it? It's like that. And uh, Alice, are you out there? Hello. Evening, Evening. to you. Hi, Hi. Alice. And also, Ella. Hi. Hi, Ellen. I, some of you may recall Ella did a uh, did a very popular talk on marine conservation zones a while back. We had a very large audience for that, and uh, I noticed the audience has increased tonight. I've got a feeling that um, it's the Ella effect which is doing this, uh, and also a theory maybe she has a very large extended family, uh, which is probably why we have so many people watching. But uh, so good evening to you all, and uh, hopefully um, uh, we'll, we'll take your mind off the storm, which is uh, heading our way outside. Um, now uh, that's we're all pretty cold here, but we always ask people uh, in the in the crowd how they how they are. Now I forgot how to do this. How do I do this? I press polls, and right, um, yeah. So question is, uh, if I launch, uh, how are you? So you can you can vote on the on your screens there. Um, uh, there's your options there. I think you can see those. Um, there you are. So uh, are you waiting for your first jab or your or your second jab or your are you all jabbed up and ready to go? Uh, have you booked your holiday to Portugal yet? And I know some people have. I'm not going to mention any names, but uh, some people have. Um, are you looking forward to giving me a hug? Um, now, I know we're allowed to give hugs, uh, but actually it's not compulsory. That, that applies to you as well, Barry. Doesn't mean, doesn't mean you gotta, it doesn't mean you've got to hug me when you see me. It's an option, okay? It's an option. <laughs> and uh, let's, have a look. Let's, let's, uh, let's end the poll. I think most of you have voted now. We'll have a few more to vote. And the last option there, are you waiting for the sun to come back so you go down to the beach? Now, I was complaining for quite a long time how sunny it was and how dry it was. And now I've been complaining for the last few weeks. It's, uh, it's just not sunny enough. Now, let's end the poll. Here's the results. There we are. So, uh, so most people are all jabbed up, ready to get going again. That's, that's good to know. But there are a few people out there still waiting for their first jab. So, uh, so hello to all you youngsters out there in the, uh, uh, out there in the crowd. Look. There we are. Look. Um, Okay, so uh, what do I press now? I press stop sharing the. I don't know. I press okay. Press that. I, I forgot already how to do this. Look and oh god, it's still not working. There we are. And also, yeah, just to point out, there's a little Q and A function on the screen. And as I always, say each month, uh, you're welcome to type your comments and questions. I can't guarantee we're going to answer them. I know Barry always has a, has a little look, don't you, Barry? Uh, we'll try. We'll try and answer some questions as we go along. But it's it's, it's very hard to do a webinar and answer questions at the same time despite how talented I am at these uh, at these webinars now. So before we go any further, I thought I'd just uh, we'll hand over to Nikki, perhaps have a chat about uh, about Wild Coast Sussex, about uh, who you are and what you do. Yeah, uh, thanks, Michael. Um, it's a really exciting project. We've got a really nice uh, partnership working on it. So Sussex Wildlife Trust are working with Marine Conservation Society um, and Sussex IFCA. So they're the Inshore Fisheries and Conservation Authority and Brighton Sea Life as well. Um, all funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund. So thanks to any of you uh, lottery players out there. Um, so we're going to be working with communities all along the Sussex coast, um, just kind of trying to kind of connect again to the coast um, in lots of different ways. Um, so thinking about the kind of benefits that we get from the coast. So just, sort of, you know, if you go down to the beach, uh, just for that kind of 
de-stressing walk. Um, and then thinking about all the things that we might be able to do as a kind of thank you to the beach and sea um, for all those benefits that we get and kind of giving back. Um, so beach cleans and things like that. So we're going to be working with schools and youth groups, um, fishermen uh, and recruiting hopefully lots of new volunteers as well. Fantastic. Sounds great. Now, just uh, I was looking at your Twitter feed uh, earlier on, uh, Nikki, and uh, so this was this was a few days ago. So what's this? Um, what's going on here? Yeah, so um, as part of the project, um, we want to try and leave the seas cleaner. So we were hoping to um, find ghost gear and remove it from the sea. So uh, if you don't know what ghost gear is, it's basically um, any fishing gear that has been uh, perhaps lost in the sea. Um, there's some there. Um, it can sort of carry on um, entangling wildlife because it was designed to catch fish. Um, and it can also break down into microplastics. So it's not very nice if it's left in the sea. Um, so we are working with another charity called Ghost Fishing UK. Um, and on Tuesday, I was lucky enough to get to go out um, on the boat with them from Brighton Marina. And we went to one of the local wrecks. It had some reports that there was some ghost gear on the wreck. So they did a, um, a survey dive and then they went down um, again and started kind of getting some of this net off and sending it back up to the surface. And this is um, what we collected on Tuesday and they were out again on Wednesday and got a whole nother big bag just like this. Um, so really great uh, way to get the, the seeds cleaned up. An important piece of work. And uh, I was trying to get hold of you today, Ella. I was trying to phone you, but apparently today you were doing a, a wild beach session. And uh, then these, these are some photos you sent me from a previous wild beach session. Yeah. Uh, so, so what's, what, what's, what's Wild Beach about? So Wild Beach is basically taking uh, school classes down onto the beach and getting them to yeah have the classroom on the beach. And it's all about sort of child-led learning and learning through play. If, any, if anyone's heard of Forest School, it's kind of taking Forest School to the beach and getting kids really enthusiastic and knowledgeable about their local beach environment so they, can, they feel sort of protective of it and you know, want, to, want to protect it. Um, so yeah, me and Nikki were actually out on the beach today in, with a class of 30 kids. And it was great. Did a bit of rock pooling. It was so nice to get out and see their faces being excited by some crabs and things. So what, why is there a fish head in a bucket? <laughs> why is there a, sea, a fish head in a bucket? So this was our last class we had on Brighton Beach and the kids found these there's quite a few of the bones and the tails. Um, and then we found this big fish head, which I think is a sea bass. Um, so, you know, put it in the bucket, um, had a look so they could see, you know, what a fish head looks like. I think its eyes had already been eaten. Um, and then we put it back on the, on the shore and they got really excited because a big, um, great back black gut back, back black backed gulls started eating it and they were extremely ex excited it was like yeah brilliant really and I've got some more photos of things it isn't all fish heads I mean some photos that Nikki sent across uh so what are these that these grapes things uh so there's some cuttlefish eggs that we found um on a wild beach session last week I think um so yeah, they get washed up on the beach sometimes. They're meant to be kind of wrapped around things on the seabed um, so that they can grow these tiny little baby cuttlefish inside. They're very cute. Um, and we pop them in the bucket in the hope that they might uh, be ready to hatch out. And then we could um, sort of release them back into the sea once they've hatched. But these ones didn't. So we just pop them back in a rock pool and hopefully um, they've hatched out now. And there's little baby cuttlefish. In there. Little cuttlefish, lovely. And uh, now I know these these are mermaids' purses. I know these from when I was a boy. So, and you still find these. I found these in the, back in the seventies, but they're still going. You know, they haven't gone out of date. <laughs> yeah, still finding them today. So uh, yeah, egg cases of um, skates and rays and sharks uh, that we find on the Sussex beaches. Um, and if you do find these, you can report them to the Shark Trust, uh, and that really helps with sort of shark conservation. Um, so, yeah. Um, here's a photo that you sent me, Alice. So another another part of your work. So what's what's going on here? Yeah. So this is part of some work that we did uh, prior to COVID. Research for the World Coast Sussex project involved kind of interviewing um, 16 to 25 year olds all along the Sussex coast mm -hmm. and asking them, you know, 
what is it that they care about with regard to their local sea? You know, what is it that they like, dislike, and what do they think could engage other young adults? You know, I mean, at Marine Conservation Society and perhaps also at Sussex Wildlife Trust, we're perhaps not the best at working with young adults yet. And so Wild Coast Sussex is a really good opportunity for us to do some learning and grow as organisations and, you know, really um, do more to better meet the needs of young adults living locally. Brilliant. Excellent. Awesome. Sounds like a really exciting project. Now, how long is this project going for? It's a few years, isn't it? Uh, yeah, we're funded for three years. Brilliant. Okay, hopefully there's plenty of opportunity to engage with uh, everybody along the coast uh, in the next three years. So uh, more details uh, later on. Um, and just speak about the coast, uh, just a bit of news. Now people are always asking, uh, but the Rye Harbour Discovery Centre, what's the update, Barry? Is it opening soon? Yes, it should be open next week. This week we've, we've been busy um, receiving groups of our volunteers to um, start training them to work from the centre and to work around the reserve. Um, it's a very complicated building. Um, it's a lovely space inside and it's going to be great at engaging with more of our um, visitors. Um, there's the view from inside looking out. So the, the, the windows look over the large salt marsh recreation project and today there were avocets and little egrets just out there and we're expecting that people will come um, and and sit in here and spend a bit of time and hopefully they'll find the information they need to go out and find out more about Rye Harbour Nature Reserve. Yes, yeah, so I spent a bit of time inside the visitor set. I came to work on Monday uh, Barry and uh, there was no one at work. Everyone, as I said, no one's answering emails or phone calls and it was a uh, the staff have been invited to like a VIP open day at the um, at the, at the Discovery Centre. Um, I hadn't been invited. I mean, I, I, I guess you were there, uh, but you imagine my my horror when I found out James was there as well. You were there, James, weren't you? I was. I was. Well, see, Anybody was there, Michael? Yeah. <laughs> apart from me, I didn't get an invite, and I, I'm not sure what you had to do to be a VIP to get an invite to this little uh, uh, this little soiree. But uh, I, I was sat I was sat in the office. Uh, did my spreadsheets and stuff. So I hope you have a nice. You think you think being um, the community hero for Roberts Bridge, as I mentioned in the last uh, nature table live, you think that'd be a VIP enough, but obviously not. I don't know what you've got to do to get in. I, th I think, Michael, you need something to do with the coast in your, in your job title. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Turn the plan for the. Yeah, yeah, okay. Maybe next maybe next time. Well, hopefully one day I'll, I'll come down. I, should, I will be allowed in. I'll probably, I'll, I'll probably have to queue up with all the other punters to get in, wouldn't I? So, uh, I don't know. Um, anyway, so we'll, 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 for those you haven't seen uh, Nature Table live before, we do have a Nature Table Facebook page and we ask people to send in their photos and, and sightings. It's a very lively page and uh, everyone's welcome to join. And uh, what I do every month, I sort of, uh, I unashamedly just go through and pillage all your photos and sightings and turn them into a, a webinar. So uh, I've chosen uh, over the last uh, over the last month, we've chosen all the, all the coastal, all the marine sort of sightings on the beach sightings. And uh, let's see what you've been seeing. Uh, over the last uh, last few weeks. Well, uh, Helen was uh, very lucky uh, walking down by Wolf and Brooks uh, to see this uh, common seal hauling out of the water. Look at that. So uh, uh, as you as you know, watching some of our webinars, a lot, a lot of these common seals do find their way uh, up the rivers. And also Sarah. Uh, Sarah managed to uh, get some lovely photos of uh, probably what I think is probably the most laid back seal I've ever seen. Look at this, um, this common seal here uh, by the river. Look, Looking pretty relaxed, looking pretty relaxed there, especially in this um, this picture. Hey, look at that, oh, really, uh, really reclining there. I just, I look like just that looks like it should have a, had a pint in its hand, be down the pub. Look, so I imagine that there it is down there. Look, you can imagine now the pubs are open. You imagine that guy propping up the bar somewhere. But lovely to see uh, a seal in, uh, in one of our rivers. And uh, now John uh, is a regular, con uh, uh, takes photographs and sends them on the website. He's, he lives uh, just down by Pevensey. Pemersey Bay. Uh, he's got a picture here of a, of a grey seal uh, from his. I think John lives right on the beach, so he's always some lovely photographs from the from the coast. There's a grey seal with a big nose there. So I always think to me, it's grey seals look like dogs, and common seals look like cats. That's, that's the way I tell them apart. But uh, I'm sure it's more scientific than that. Um, here's another, another mammal. This uh, John this isn't, isn't really a coastal mammal, but uh, there's a there's a fox running down along the beach there, and also. Uh, 
Well, John Felgraf, this is a bit of a sad story of a porpoise which was stranded um, and uh, down there near, near Pemmersey on the bay there. Whoops, what's happened here? My, my, oh, that's it. And uh, unfortunately, it was uh, the East Sussex Wildlife Rescue were called and the British Divers Marine Life Rescue were also called. Unfortunately, it didn't survive, but uh, um, it's amazing to think these animals are out there. It's a shame that uh, sometimes the only chance you get to see them is when they are kind of a bit too close to shore. But um, so anytime if you do see any stranded uh, animals out there, please uh, either give us a call at the Wild Call Service or call the local wildlife rescue services, send the professionals in to try and help. Now, um, here's something interesting. This is a picture which Alison West sent in. Now, uh, she saw some on Chelsea Beach um, and she Googled it um, and she thought it was an American horseshoe crab. Now, you should never Google anything because uh, uh, it can lead you into all sorts of trouble when it comes to wildlife identification. Uh, I can see what she means. I know what horseshoe crabs look like with those big sort of tails. But um, what's happened here? What's the thing? There we are. Look. Uh, then other people, though, sort of commenting, uh, Cornelia said, is it a masked crab? And a few people said, it's a, is, is it a masked crab? And I've never heard of masked crab, so I googled um, masked crab. And this um, again shows you the dangers of uh, sort of uh, got into a bit of a rabbit hole watching uh, episodes of The Masked Singer, which was just dreadful, absolutely dreadful. I can't believe I was watching it. But here's a video that's uh, awesome film, though, of this incredible thing. Now, I don't know, Nikki, Ella, Alice, did you? Do you know about mass crabs? I never heard of them. <laughs> Great comments. Yeah, yeah. So they they bury themselves in the sand and they use those little appendages to sort of they stick them out of the sand. Basically, it forms like a snorkel. The two yeah. they put two together to form like a snorkel that they can breathe like a little breathing tube out of the sand. It's very cool. Just just clarify. Is it is it is it where's the head? Is the head with the the thing on it? Yeah. The head's, the head's on the right hand side, yeah? <laughs> yeah, the bit with the kind of oh. unicorn horn. All oh, right, okay. I can see. All right. Okay, so that's so I mentioned your picture. The head, all right, so it's the head's the up. Okay, I can see where its claws are. All right, okay. You can see my expertise on uh, on, on crabs. <laughs> I'm not too sure which way it's facing. Michael, Michael, yeah. on that image, can you see that there's the, the shape of a face on its back? Oh, like, oh yeah, a nose and two eyes. Yeah, you yeah. see that. I think that's where it comes from. The name comes from. I might be wrong, but that's what I thought. That is a uh, wow. Yeah, now, now I've seen it. I can't unsee it. It's quite a. Uh, I recognise that face from somewhere. Just I mean, someone. Anyway, um, now there's lots of these on the nature table. Remember last um, we saw some of these on the last webinar. Someone sent a picture in, which looks. Um, it reminds me of the days. Uh, I don't remember Barry and James back when we did the. Uh, they were dogs vomit or um or or slime mold remember that it looks a bit like dogs vomit but uh um I remember last month uh, someone posted some pictures uh, of Pemersey bay they thought it was something with 20 legs um and people were sort of thinking it was egg pot and i i i was googling it pretty quick but uh oh barry yates got in first <laughs> barry was in literally a minute before i got there he, got, he was in with squid eggs now um now, I, I've never seen, I've been, I've been wandering up and down the beaches all my life. I've never seen squid eggs before, but they seem to be quite a common, a common sight. Uh, this, um, these were taken uh, on May the 10th. Does anyone know what this is, please, says, uh, says Ellie. And, and someone jumped in straight away with a, a Donald Trump's wig, which I can see. I can see the similarity. I can see the similarity there. Um, but luckily, our, uh, our nature table spotters, uh, are, are, they're learning pretty quick because they all knew there were, there were squid eggs. Uh, and then what are squid eggs here? So, so there's how many eggs are in these? Is, are they full of eggs? Is that how it works? Yeah, there'd be lots of them in there. One of the um, one of the kids found them on the beach today, actually. In the wow. Morning. So how come I've never seen squid eggs in my life? There's there's uh, again, it, I mean, perhaps in the seventies they weren't around so much, but I don't know. Well, there's only a certain time of year that they wash up, right? There's only you know they only like breed in the spring so you have to be out at the beach on the beach at the right time of year to have chance you know seeing them and i suppose after the stormy weather that we're having more of is perhaps why you didn't see them so much when you were younger um you know potentially with the stormier weather we're having now more eggs are being dodged and washed up yeah, I I guess. <laughs> okay so no i should get on the beach more J James, do you, if you, 
Have you ever seen a squid eggs before? Yeah, a few times actually. Um, oh. down at, yeah, sorry, Michael. Down at Rye Harbour and down at uh, Canberra quite a lot. Yeah. Okay, so, so, so just me then. No, it's not just me. Though, if it makes you feel. This better. is why we all got the invite to the. Yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah. Squid egg, squid egg watches only or something. Just like, I just show you squid eggs at the door to get in or something. Was that how it worked? Yeah. Ridiculous. It was, yeah. And there's some more. There's some, there's some and there she says, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're not. See, they're squid eggs or, uh, or Donald Trump's wig. And this is actually a picture of Alison here. Now, this is quite interesting. Now, I've never seen these before either, unsurprisingly. Um, did anyone know what these are, please? You keep seeing them on the beach, says Alison. And uh, uh, strange little weird sort of shapes on the beach here. Uh, someone, Chris, reckon they were mermaids nail clippings. Not too sure um, what we think of that. But, um, but Victoria jumped in and said they were, again, egg masses of necklace slash moon snails now again i've never heard of moon snails never heard of them so i've uh, I, I went to google and uh I struck lucky this time because moon snails they're actually amazing things they, they, now these aren't sort of british moon snails but uh, uh the, around the world they're pretty colorful um but ours ours isn't so colorful but still quite impressive that's a that's the necklace shell there um and they create these things now alice do you know about about these i think we were chatting earlier on well, no, it was just, um, it's really amazing how they create that kind of plastic egg uh, case shape. And the, the way they do it is that they, um, as they secrete their, their eggs in within its case, um, they kind of do it around the corner of their shell. And so as they push more eggs out, it creates that curled effect. Um, and oh, wow. It creates the circle so yeah it's, it's pretty amazing um kind of feat of nature really yeah never heard of them i have now i've, I've learned i'm learning lots tonight this is good i like enjoying this um they're sorry they're just they're known as sand collars they're egg masses sand collars okay and you can see so you can see that's a that's a complete one on the left and the one photographed uh, on the right okay right i can uh now, when it comes to strange things on the beach, now I'm going to hand over to Barry on this one because uh, uh, I know this is one of Barry's favourites. Yeah, this is uh, a very hairy creature. Perhaps it could be a mermaid's uh, wig. I'm not sure, but they turn up after storms uh, along the, uh, the beach of Sussex. <coughs> and if we can go to the next picture, this is a... Uh, zoomed out or we'll get there coming very slowly um it's not a a hairy mammal it's a, a hairy worm and it's uh, lives in there it is they're they're about 100 millimeters long and often when they're washed up they look as though they're completely dead but some manage to survive um and they're it's a sea mouse and I learned today that the plural of a sea, ma of sea mouse is sea mice. It doesn't fit very well, um, I don't think. But if we can start the little video. So, so they're not mice, they're, they're, they're worms. Yeah, let's just worms. make sure I've got this right. Yeah, yeah right. they're worms. So they're, they're about 100 millimetres long, about four inches long. And they, they burrow through the sand. And this is one I sort of released back from being washed up on the shingle. And it was probably a bit stunned by the storm, but it, I thought it was worth doing. And yeah, they, they're a voracious predator. They, they, they eat worms and, and shrimps and things. And uh, I think most of the time they live under the sand. But as the storms are coming, as we speak, if you're along the shore, they are worth a, a look out because they are curious things. They really are. That's, uh, that's amazing. <laughs> look at that. At least I can work out which ends which in this one because it's, it's heading that way. But I mean, I, I'm going to head down the beach after this storm uh, tomorrow because I reckon uh, there's a lot of things I haven't seen yet, I want to see. So thank you for that, Barry. It's uh, what? Is that moving? Where's it gone? There we are. So there's some of the, the amazing things um, you can see on the coast in Sussex, uh, which I've never seen, which uh, I hope to see one day. Now, the thing is, I do spend a lot of time uh, looking around uh, rock pools and around the beaches. Uh, and um, his, uh, you know, around the, around the coast of Sussex, there's some great rock pools. I've been at rock pool with Nicky many times. So what I thought I'd do, I thought I'd ask, ask the team this evening to uh, think of the coolest thing. What's the coolest thing you can think of in a rock pool? 
and I've asked them to, uh, they're only allowed a, a minute maximum to, um, to try and impress the, uh, the viewers at home with the coolest thing in the rock pool. And at the end, we've got six things, and uh, at the end, we'll ask the viewers at home to vote for what is the coolest. So you've got a minute to, uh, to convince everyone why your, why your thing, why your rock pool uh, creature or plant or whatever is, uh, is the coolest. So we're going to start, um, uh, we'll start with James. I think now you chose the velvet swimming crab, James. I did. I did. Right, so you got. I, I, I can't find the kitchen egg timer, but so you got <laughs> less than a minute to tell us why they're so amazing. Yeah, well, I love them. I mean, they they've got these. Uh, they really live up to their name. They've got these kind of velvety, uh, downy hairs across the shell. Uh, they're the kind of largest and fastest of all our swimming crabs. And actually, you can't really tell in this photo, but they've got this beautiful sort of striking uh, blue coloration on the claws and on the legs. And on the shell. So why haven't you got me a photo that shows that, Michael? That's, <laughs> where is it? Where is that photo? <laughs> it's quite a dirty crab I got there. Look, sorry, a bit muddy. Exactly. This is a terrible example, folks. There's normally a lot bluer. There's a lot of blue on them. All right. Okay, uh, time, James. Time's up. Time's up. We've got very muddy crab there, James. No one's oh, going to vote for that. Right. It's too muddy. It's muddy crab. You took my top line. The eyes. Come on. Yeah, devil, devil crab, devil crab because of the red eyes. And I have to <laughs> say, folks, as well. You know, if you take a bit of pleasure in other people getting bitten by crabs or nipped by crabs, this is the crab that's going to do it for you because they're really feisty. They're also known as the fighter crab. I absolutely love them. I mean, it's brilliant. What could be better than other people getting nipped by crabs? Come on, everybody. It's like... <laughs> All right, OK. All right, so that's a, a vicious, a vicious muddy crab with the vicious, red eyes, right? No, so... A vicious blue crab, a vicious blue crab, Michael. Come on, come on. Uh, now, um, Ella, you're next. You've got snake locks and enemy. Yeah, so snake locks and anemones, I think they're really cool. They've got, um, well, like all anemones, they've got ten tentacles, but they never retract them. So even if you see them out of the water, they've got their bright green tentacles out, up to 200 of them. They're often bright green with purple tips on the tentacles, which you can kind of see in this picture. Um, and they're green because they have a special protein in their cells, which will actually um, glow fluorescent green if you shine a UV light on them, which I think is amazing. So they glow in the dark animals. They also have a um, special relationship with a type of algae called zooxanthellae, which creates, um, it's a photosynthetic algae, which creates energy for them from the sun. Um, they've got a mouth in the center of their tentacles, which they catch using their stinging cells. Um, they're just really cool. They look really alien and they're just one of my okay. favorites. I should have a little buzzer, shouldn't I? I need to, anyway, I should have thought of that. Uh, so thank you. Thank you. So you've got, some, you've got a glow in the dark anemone there. That's great. Um, now, brittle star, that was you, Barry, wasn't it? That was me, yes. So I rarely see brittle stars, but I can remember one <coughs> I found in a rock pool um, at pet level, which was bright orange. And I just thought it was an amazing little animal. Those, those long, very slender legs, there's five of them, five-fold symmetry, like, like most starfish. Um, but they're just so slender, attached to a little disc of a body. And the, the one I remember was was, was orange. Um, but what my plea is, don't necessarily vote for my brittle stars, but just remember this, they are brittle. So when you, if you come across one and you handle them, be very gentle and uh, just be careful. Otherwise they'll, they'll fall apart. The clue is in the name. Okay, thank you, Barry. More of a public service announcement there, uh, but uh, thank you for that. Um, okay, now, uh, Nikki, you've got Shani. Yes. So uh, this is, you call it Shani, I call it a Blenny, it's a common Blenny. Um, even its name is cool, it comes from the Greek blenos, which means slime, because it's covered in slime. Uh, so rather than having um, scales like most fish, to keep themselves uh, wet so they can actually survive out of water, cool fish, um, they're covered in slime. Um, and they've got these great big fins at the front so they're good at swimming but they can also walk around so if they need to get to another rock pool then they can do that and they can change colour so if you find them in some sort of uh, brown seaweed and then pop them in um, a white bucket you'll watch them change colour in front of your very eyes to camouflage themselves and they just look really cool they've got these funny googly eyes on their head and that's so that they can watch out for any predators as well so amazing <laughs> Pretty cool. A colour, a colour changing fish is pretty cool, I mean, and uh, so that's pretty good. I must. Admit, I do love, do love Shani. Do love a Shani. Uh, now, uh, Alice, now you've got some seaweed. Alrighty. Okay. So um, I chose the pepper dulse 
This is a small red seaweed that can get to be about eight centimeters big. Um, along the higher shore, if you find it, it's generally kind of yellow green, but as um, you kind of move down the shore, it can be red. Um, and it is just a really cool seaweed. So I've come up with three reasons why you should vote for this seaweed. So number one, it is really flat. It is characteristically flat. It exists in 2D. Why be 3D when you can be 2D? Number two, um, you can eat it. It is absolutely delicious. It tastes like umami, maybe a bit of mushroom, peppery, salty, a bit of mineral. It's known as the truffle of the sea. And it is, you know, something that moving forward is going to be a really important food for us people. It's also culturally important. So around the 1850s, if you were walking the streets of Glasgow or Edinburgh, you might have heard someone yelling by dulf or tangle. And that is because people used to eat it a lot more than we do now. My um, third and final reason why you should vote for pepper dulf compared to everybody else's is because um, red seaweeds are around 2 billion years old. And so evolutionarily, mine is the oldest. It was around before the dinosaurs, not maybe that one, but it's cousins and therefore it is the best. <laughs> okay, well, actually, you, actually you've made that, made that seaweed sound pretty exciting. Thank you, thank you, Alice. Uh, and my, my one, I've gone for common prawn. So common prawns just uh, I just love common prawns because they always remind me of uh, being uh, being young on holiday looking at little rock pools seeing a little prawn dart back into the darkness I love the uh, the socks they wear I love the stripes the tiger stripes on them look really really cool with the tiger stripes um, now a little fact for about uh, for you prawn lovers out there female prawns carry their fertilized eggs on their legs and they can carry up to 4,000 eggs on their legs that's gonna be worth your vote surely isn't it uh, and, and finally, as you can see, they also have laser laser eyes. They can actually, they kill their prey. They, can, they kill crabs and, and sharks and whales with their laser eyes. Uh, and you can see them there. And also sometimes uh, they wear little top hats uh, and they can, they, they, look, they dance around in the rock pools. So uh, that's pretty cool. Uh, you know, a little, a little prawn which has a top hat and laser eyes. Surely that's, uh, that's going to be worth something. So, uh, so there's the, um, there's your six species. Now, I think if I press this button up here, I can uh, well, do this. So here we are. Love this works. Now, now is the time at home, folks, for you to uh, to vote. Now uh, we launched that. There we go. So it was uh, James's velvet swimming crab. His member is a bit muddy, as you remember. It wasn't uh, wasn't too colourful. Uh, there was uh, Ella's glow in the dark anemone. That was pretty cool. At the uh, Barry's brittle star, which you know, if you don't vote for it, please take on Barry's message of never pick one up. Um, the shanny was changed colour and could walk on its fins. Now, uh, there was Alice's pepper dulse, which sounded was the, the ancient and tasty pepper dulse. Or, of course, there was the prawns uh, with the laser, uh, the laser beams for eyes. So um, now the folks are coming in. Uh, now, I guess you can't see at home yet, but I can see all this. Uh, well, there's, there's definitely oh, actually two of them, actually. I suppose there's a lot of seaweed fans out there, Alice. I don't know if you bought, uh, you've, got, you've got your friends voting for that one. Can I, um, can I just ask Alice a question, please? Yes. Um, some uh, Karen's asked, she missed what it was called, something of the sea, the pepper dulse. The truffle, truffle of the, the truffle. sea. Truffle okay. of the sea, okay. Maybe that, that could have gained you a few extra votes there, Alice. Let's have a look. Okay, well, uh, I think 85% of people have voted. I think 15% haven't bothered. That's fair enough. I can understand that. Um, so let's end the polling. And if I share the results, look at that. Wow, it looks like Nikki, uh, the shanny, uh, it's got the top 30. But the uh, pepper dulse, that's pretty good for a seaweed. Uh, pretty good for a seaweed. Um, brittle, uh, and then, then, then Ella's snake looks an enemy. Wait, wait a minute. Okay, I, I thought I was last for a moment there, but luckily uh, uh, the prawns just beaten the brittle stars and the velvet swimming crab. I must admit, it wasn't the best velvet swimming crab picture. If I chose a... You ruined mine. You ruined mine. <laughs> you were robbed. Oh, yeah. James was robbed. Is this revenge for Bly Harbor Discovery Centre? Exactly it's what it is. It's yeah. exactly what it is. It's strange how it's strange how both uh, both Barry and James uh, ended up at the bottom. Uh, but I'll teach you. Next time, invite me to the Vista Centre. That's what I'm saying. Next time, invite me. You may have more chance for a better photo. Okay. Well, thanks, folks. Well, that's um, that's the, uh, that's the that's the Rockpool interactive part of the show over. So uh, let's uh, we'll move on. Now, where are we going? Whoops. Oh, no, look. You all see that? Okay. Okay, right. Stop sharing results. This is a bit confusing, this bit. 
and then all right well okay there it is okay here we are we're back right now uh, i did ask uh, when we planned this little web we do plan these things by the way i know we don't think that we do but we do plan these things uh i had a chat with the uh the wild Coast sussex team and they said they wouldn't mind highlighting some of the fantastic endangered species um around the uh around the coast here so i asked them to pick uh, kind of some six species to talk about so i'm not sure who's talking about what but uh, i hope we've got the right photo so uh, uh angela ray who's uh anyone to say something about that sure um, yeah well, <laughs> you go for it, well we'll both do it it's fine i mean i just love these i think they are the most beautiful rays that we have They're really incredible um and they can be found in some of our uh, sort of offshore marine conservation zones around sussex so they've got some good habitat for them there the kind of sand and gravel beds that they like they make some good hunting grounds for them um and you can also find their egg cases washed up on the beach so those pictures we showed earlier of the mermaid's purse have a look out for them um, and report them to the Shark Trust if you find them. Yeah, that's, that's a gorgeous looking thing. Look, look, look at the pattern on that. I, I can see I can see a face there as well, Barry. I think I just work out a little. You can. I can see. I can see a face there. I can see a face in most things, to be honest. Now, I, now look at this. Now, I, I couldn't believe when I googled this this thing to put a picture up. I, I couldn't believe this was actually off the coast of Sussex. But uh... well, that's the thing. Sadly not anymore they used to be widespread a lot around europe and africa but basically now they have a very um small distribution because they've their numbers have declined so rapidly they are um classed as critically endangered on the iucn red, red list of endangered species so that's kind of the most critical category that something can be in it means you know they are at risk of extinction in the near future um they're actually thought to be regionally in the North Sea, for example, um, and basically commercial fishing over time has caused their numbers to drastically decrease um, through basically like trawling bycatch. So they like to, you see from their flat bodies, they like to just hang out on the bottom of the seabed. So it makes them very vulnerable to being um, caught by big trawlers. And that has, yeah, decimated their numbers, sadly. So it's unlikely to see them around here anymore. Wow, that's really uh the last reports were in the 90s so fishermen saw them off the coast of sussex there you go the kind of thing i write books about this this is really quite uh quite depressing but uh yeah it's amazing amazing looking thing though incredible okay. yeah absolutely fascinating look at this look short a short snouted seahorse anybody yeah. any takers <laughs> short looking... seahorses. yeah yeah so you can find these Definitely find these in Sussex, although I never have. I don't know if any of you guys have ever seen one. No. There are apparently absolutely loads in Brighton Marina. Apparently they love it there. And that's where loads of records come from is, um, yeah, somewhere that, you know, we might think of as being quite kind of uh, humanized and impacted, but seems to be somewhere they like to be. <laughs> I, 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 I think I may have seen a seahorse when I was young, but um, well, it's been a long time since I had the pleasure of seeing a, a seahorse. Maybe I get to go in the Brighton Marina. I think that's where I need to go. Um, now, here's one. Here's a face we saw earlier on. Another very relaxed uh, common seal. Now, we had, a, we had a few talks about common seals. Uh, we had uh, talks about, by John Arnott about seals uh, previously on our webinars. But uh, um, any uh, any comments about this little little, little beauty? Oh, can I butt in? Oh, Barry. You can see them from the windows of the Discovery Center swimming swimming by. So look out when you visit, Michael. Oh well, yeah, if if, if I'm allowed in, yeah. There's quite Fantastic. a little there's quite a little colony developing in the Rother Estuary, um, probably about a dozen individuals and possibly breeding there. So and that's a very new thing. Well, so you have a cup of tea and look at the uh watch the seal swimming past. Fantastic. Did you just charge extra for that? Lovely. So um now are these are these endangered in uh, around the coast or so these are listed as least concern, and that basically means they're at lower lower risk of extinction, but they're still an important species for biodiversity, so they're still kind of monitored. Um, and so then, you know, if we find that their populations are declining, then, you know, actions can be developed to prevent them becoming more threatened in the future. Um, I think their populations have declined in certain sort of localised populations around the UK. Um, but you can see them at Chichester Harbour, obviously at Rye, as Barry mentioned. Um, but yeah, there's a rookery at Chichester Harbour where you can see them. Um, oh. Less abundant, we get fewer 
of the common seals or also known as harbour seals in the UK than grey seals, but we have we're lucky enough to have this colony at Chichester Harbour. But yeah, I'm just thinking, I just think how lucky we are in Sussex to have, you know, so much great wildlife on the land and also of course on the uh, just off the coast as well. I mean, we're not very they're, they're, they're threatened by um sorry Nikki, I'm interrupting. No, I was just saying one did actually swim past me the other day. Yeah, we are, we are, we are very lucky. Threatened by ghost fishing gear, as what Nikki was talking about earlier. Okay, brilliant. So some of the work the project's doing is going to hopefully help these uh, yeah. the incredible animals look amazing. And they are pretty gorgeous, even I've got to admit that. And uh, fish off with a, a cod, a fish we all heard of, but uh, it's on the endangered uh, list. Yeah, so it's listed as vulnerable, so not quite as bad as being listed as endangered or critically endangered, but it does mean that it's, yeah, populations are sort of globally declining, um, and this is basically due to overfishing. Okay, well, actually, that's a very, very neat link, uh, Ellen, to our next, uh, the next part of the tonight's webinar, because we're having to talk about what uh, what we can do, what, what, how, how our behaviour, how our behaviour could uh, could be changed to uh, to help a marine conservation. And uh, I've been chatting to Alice about uh, the Good Fish Guide. So I'm going to hand over to Alice now to uh, if you just give me a nod, Alice. I'll, I'll, I'll change your slides over. Yeah, thank you so much. So. Um... So the Good Fish Guide is produced by the Marine Conservation Society every year, and um, we actually provide over around 700 seafood sustainability ratings covering about 150 species. And um, so I guess I just wanted to tell you a bit, bit more about that. Uh, so next slide, please. So um, globally, you know, over 40% of fisheries around sorry, around the UK are subject to overfishing. And, you know, within in the UK, we have some of the most heavily used seas. Now, when we think about fish, we have two kinds of fish that we eat. We eat wild caught fish and we eat farmed fish. And the sustainability of wild caught seafood relies on three main factors. Firstly, being the kind of the size and the health of a fish population, which is what we call a stock. And secondly, how that stock is managed to make sure that the fish populations don't decline. And then thirdly, the impact of that capture method, such as um, trawling or potting actually on the seabed or on other creatures, which could be caught unintentionally, which is known as bycatch. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so we created, we create the Good Fish Guide because we recognize that there are you know, social and economic implications around catching fish, you know, and, and globally, billions of people rely on seafood as their only source of protein. You know, if you think about the Arctic, where, you know, it's not so easy, or, or, or communities living in very cold places, it's really hard to get protein any other way other than from the sea, and also, you know, in, in tropical places too. Um, so in the UK, we are a big importer of seafood. We don't eat most of what we catch. Um, and, you know, arguably um, sustainable aquaculture, so that's fish farming, is the way forward. But there are a lot of ways that it can improve still. And in the UK, the seafood industry represents about 14,000 jobs. OK, next. Thank you. Um, so with a good fish guide we um, essentially do all these things to try and help people make better choices about the fish that they eat if you choose to eat fish so next please um, so the good fish guide rating sorry I, I should have said the good fish guide um, scores um, all the fish that we we can with um, one being the most sustainable and five being the worst and so actually the same fish species can receive a different score depending on where they are caught and how they are caught. So for example, in Sussex, a place caught by otter trawl scores a two, but a place, scored, caught, a place caught by beam trawl actually scores a three because beam trawling has a greater impact on the seabed. So sorry, I think I've just got myself a little bit turned around, but essentially, the Good Fish Guide is having a really helpful impact on big kind of supermarkets 
and other retailers. Next slide, please. And it's something like one in seven fish meals sold in the UK has gone through the Good Fish Guide rating system. So that's really good. So sorry to have gotten myself a bit mixed up, but this is what I was describing when I said that we give it a um, traffic light system. So red is avoid, orange is think about, and green is a better choice. So for the place that I was just mentioning, you know, uh, the, the, the Otter Troll Court place, that scores a two, that is a better choice, but the three score, that is not so good, and maybe think about that. Next slide, please. So obviously there are fish caught all around the country, but because we're talking about Sussex, we're with Sussex Wildlife Trust, let's go local. So great option if you if you want to buy wild caught fish is the Dover Sole for you know supporting local fishermen. The stock is in a really healthy state and it's not being overfished. Locally, herring is also an okay option, but it needs improvement as the stock is currently okay but decreasing and it really needs more management. Um, and you know, I, I do have to say that with the Good Fish Guide, there are some species that are scored a five, which is red rating, regardless of where or how they are caught. And that is because they may be endangered, such as the European eel. So, you know, please don't eat that, guys. And many shark species as well. So mm -hmm. you might go to a restaurant or get your fish and chips day, and you might see hus or, or rock salmon on the menu. That is actually um a kind of uh, local shark that we have and that is um, an animal that we really don't want to be eating. Farmed, if you're, if you're interested in farm species, mussels are really good um, from the UK, also farmed scallop um, and uh, yeah halibut are probably our best and easiest kind of fish to, to think about. So I just have a final quick um, kind of tip really for you all about you know when you're thinking about if you want to eat seafood what you're going to eat um, and you know mix it up um 80 percent of the seafood that we eat in the uk is just made up of five species cod haddock salmon tuna and prawns and this puts a lot of pressure on only a handful of species which leads to really unsustainable fishing and aquaculture practices so mix it up Break out of the box, try something new, like farm shellfish um, and so on. Definitely avoid red rated seafood. You can check it out on the Good Fish Guide our website. Think about the impact of the um, fishing method that you um, are, are, are eating. I don't have enough time to talk about that tonight, but there again is more on the Good Fish Guide website. And if you're really stuck, you don't have your phone with you, you can't look for the Good Fish Guide rating of the fish that you want to eat, check for an eco label, label, okay? The Marine Stewardship Council, the Aquaculture Stewardship Council, organic, best aquaculture practice, anything that can make it better um, is something at least. Fantastic, thank, thank you. As it, it, it says down to us now to take responsibility for this. Now, I, I'm, I'm quite bad, I, I, don't, I don't actually eat much fish, but I did, Recently, started in Dover Sole, which uh, which is absolutely lovely, and, uh, and actually, I've, I don't feel too guilty eating it now. So, it's, uh, so thank you for that. But it's certainly Pleasure. something to bear in mind, folks, when, when we're out uh, shopping, uh, what we're buying, because it, it, now's the time to start taking taking action and changing our behaviour. So, uh, so thank you for that. And, and so, good the good um, the good fish guides on. If you find that online everywhere. You just Google that, and. Um, yeah, that's right. And coming soon to the Good Fish Guide is um, a barcode scanner. So the supermarket own brands, you'll be able to know instantly whether it's a good choice or not. Great, great idea. Thank you, Alice. That's great. Now, uh, I look back, let's talk back, look at some of the photos from the, from the Nature Table Facebook page. Now, just, I'll just put this here just for any entomologists out there, because uh, the picture taken by Thomas of uh, quite a rare, uh, a rare wasp. Uh, Theroscopus hemipteran. This was found at Rye Harbour, Barry. Were you, uh, were you aware of this? I was aware that Thomas was here and he met up with Chris Bentley, our in-house entomologist, okay. and they, they went off and uh, I hadn't heard what they found, so right. good, good news. Yes, yeah, it's just a, a very, so yeah, there's a rare wasp they found on the, on the seaweed over there. 
Uh, of course, around the coast, um, some fantastic birds uh, nesting and uh, traveling uh, past the coast. Um, here's a lovely photo by James of uh, an oyster catcher chasing off uh, a raven uh, over there at Rye Harbor. And I couldn't, uh, had, I couldn't resist putting this picture in by James of uh, not really a coastal bird, but you do see them around the coast uh, when they, if you're very lucky, uh, this is one of the, uh, the hoopoos, which were, there's quite a few, uh, quite a few, there were a few seen in the last few weeks. Rotting Dean, here's, here's one at Rye. Look at that, uh, very extravagant, extravagant bird there. Uh, here's John uh, taking more photographs down at, uh, at Pemmersey Bay. These gorgeous looking uh, bar-tailed gulbits moving uh, from, uh, from Africa, heading, heading further north and just passing by Sussex. As are these, uh, these wimbrels, um, kind of like a smaller version of the curlew. And uh, of course, this bird we're all familiar with. Now, I know that some people don't like them. Don't know why. Uh, people, it's funny. People move to the people move to the coast, move to the move to Sussex, and uh, be by the sea, and then they complain there's seagulls here. Never, never understand that. But uh, Sarah's a fan. Um, I never get bored with their antics. Says uh, says Sarah, and here's one here in her, in her back garden. I love them. I absolutely love them. Um, nice picture here by Vicky. Uh, a great crested grebe uh, taken uh, just a, a few days ago. So, so back in April, sorry, uh, out on the sea. Uh, she was a bit confused. Uh, is it these birds you usually see, of course, on sort of freshwater lakes and uh, uh, inland, but uh, you see quite a lot of them in the sea in the in the uh, in the winter. You see a few from Rye Harbour, I'd imagine, Barry. Yeah, in Rye Bay, in the early months of the year, there can be several hundred out there. Wow! And there, I, I saw some today, and, and in the past, I've even seen them displaying on the sea. Really? Uh, that, that's that's very unusual, but yeah, they're regulars anywhere there's fish food. Okay. Uh, some pictures taken by Vicky here uh, of some of the birds along the cliffs. Here's the undercliff at uh, Salt Dean, the, the rock pipit, uh, which you'll see along there. And some classic uh, birds of the uh, Sussex Cliffs, the, uh, the jackdaws, uh, the fulmer, and the, and the shelduck, uh, picture taken by uh, Greta here. I don't know why these shelduck were uh, wandering around Hope Gap, uh, not particularly uh, known for dwelling around cliff, cliff edges, but uh, there they are. Some, some shell duck there. And some common turns passing by uh, Pevensey again. And uh, here's one of my favorite turns. I know it's one of James's favorites. So I've asked James to uh, uh, say a few words about this lovely bird, which is the, uh, the sandwich turn. Yeah, it's beautiful, isn't it? This one here with a, with a sand deal, as you can see. Um, so yeah, the sandwich turn, it's a really elegant turn and it's really, um, it's really pale as well. You know, it's really, really white. So I think it's, uh, it's kind of whiteness really emphasizes just how elegant it is uh, and it's the largest of our turns so it's kind of round about the size of a black headed gull um, but it's probably a little bit slimmer so looking at the other turn species actually they're significantly smaller than the sandwich turn and you can see actually in the breeding season the sandwich turns have this beautiful uh, black cap but actually that starts turning kind of white um, you know sort of later through the breeding season so from late summer uh, they kind of no longer have that that full black cap so you can see here a lovely breeding colony at, uh, taken by oh, taken by Barry at Rye Harbour. And of course, you know, Rye is, is really uh, one of the two critical breeding areas for sandwich turn across Sussex. So thanks to Barry and, and the team at Rye, uh, obviously the habitat there has been developed, uh, you know, the, the electric fencing, you know, to try and prevent kind of mammalian predation on the nest. And actually uh, nesting with black-headed gulls has been really beneficial for sandwich terns because it gives them a little bit of extra protection as well, uh, protection in numbers. So you can see they're very distinctive. They've got a really distinctive black beak with a little yellow tip, um, which makes them, ah, look at that. They're fun. When they're displaying, when they're together as well, you, you, you get this kind of wing drooping um, and, you know, with sort of uh, kind of erecting those crests as well. And they just, they're, they're really elegant, aren't they? Really beautiful. Uh, really I've cool. got, uh, I think I've got a video here. I think I actually made one of Barry's videos. I think of the, of the display. Should I? Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah there's there's a sound as well. Yeah, there's, there's sound, so you're going to hear it as well, so. Okay. How noisy, though. Like. <laughs> They're real posers, aren't they? Real posers. <laughs> But uh, it's interesting, actually, because although they are a really pretty, really elegant turn, that call is 
it's pretty grating to be honest with you. I mean, out of all, you know, it's by far the yeah, by far the scratchiest really of all. Real nails down a blackboard sort of thing, isn't it? Yeah, really, yeah. It's it's not very nice, but it is very distinctive, and it makes them very easy to uh, you know to pick out when they are fishing. Um, they do tend to um, they don't tend to hover when they're fishing in quite the same manner that you see uh, sort of common terns doing. But they often when they plunge, they often will sort of be underwater for for slightly longer, uh, whereas the common terns tend to sort of you know dip in and out like not not in marsh turn style, but they do tend to kind of you know come in and out a little bit quicker. Um, but yeah, I mean, the calls often kind of alert you to their presence, you know, right the way along the south coast if they are out fishing. Um, but as I say, you really the two kind of core breeding areas, you know, uh, over at Rye and then right over the other side of the county. So, yeah, lovely right. really, really lovely. Nice. Thank you. Thank you, James. Thank you for that. Um, now, I have a message from our uh, from our sponsors here. It's uh, a slight uh, an advert here. Uh, the Wildlife Trust 30 Days Wild starts in... Uh, 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 1st of June. So we encourage people to get out there and do something wild every day for a month. So uh, I've got a, little, a short 30 second video. So I'll just play that. Here we are. Let's give you some ideas of how you can go wild in, uh, in June. Yeah, so because that's our 30 days wild challenge just do one one wild thing uh, every day it doesn't have to be anything too big but uh it's a very popular event every year so you can sign up for all, the, all your fact sheets and uh all your downloads and stuff and, and start taking part uh, throughout june now one of the uh, one of the guys in that little video there was uh doing his bit for the for the planet by clearing up um his local area and something we've been doing at the, with the wildlife trust is organizing beach cleans uh, over the over the past few years uh, there's all sorts of uh, strange things you can find on the beaches around uh, around Sussex. There's uh, uh, also a lot of rubbish, a lot of plastic rubbish, like these cable ties, for example. Um, Forty percent of the fiver. Someone found that in a recent uh, beach clean. If you do have the other sixty percent of the fiver, I'm uh, I'm happy to uh, give you two pound uh, for the rest of it. Um, I'm sure I can take it back together again. It's not a bad deal. I've got the uh, the other bit here. Look. So if you want, if you do have the other bit, um, I'll pay two pound for it. Uh, also, uh, some teeth, teeth retainers, false teeth, all sorts of things you find amongst the. Uh... Here's a surprise. It's a bit of a surprise for a beach cleaner. A little, uh, a little adder. Uh, you don't always find adders, but this adder was, uh, was, was right out on the beach there. Was moved a bit more inland, away from the incoming tide. Uh, and a pair of pants. Um, find all sorts on the beach. If you again, if you do, if you do know if these are your pants, um, we still have them here. So please uh, put put something in the comments there. I, they can be returned. Uh, Research. Actually, I've grown quite attached to these over the years, but uh, uh, no one's claimed them yet. Um, but Nikki, there's a, there's a beach clean planned tomorrow, wasn't there? Uh, well, there was, yeah. So it's Endangered Species Day tomorrow. So um, we were sort of hoping to encourage people to sort of celebrate that by going down to the beach, enjoying the beach, and then giving something back by sort of doing a quick beach clean. That's one of our messages uh, for the Wild Coast Sussex project. Just leave the beach cleaner than you found it. Um, unfortunately, tomorrow there's a bit of a storm on the way. Yeah, um, sort of 60 mile an hour gusts coming, which is um, gale force 10. So please don't go down to the beach uh, tomorrow. It might be a little windy, but that's actually quite good because after a storm, uh, you can get loads washed up on the beach. So there might be lots of interesting finds. So things that you can um, pop on the Facebook page of um, creatures that get washed up that uh, everyone can identify but also probably unfortunately lots of litter getting washed up as well so just after a storm when it's calmed down and it's uh, nice and safe to go back to the beach is a good time to go um, and clean up the beach so maybe on Saturday it would be a great time to go down have a nice time on the beach see if you find any interesting finds um, in the strand line washed up and do your bit for a little quick beach clean as well. Hey, I I'm, Nick, I'm sold on that idea. So, so I can get down there with my, my bag, get a load of uh, pants and five pound notes in the bag, what have you, and uh, and they also find some you know, some sea mice and some you know uh, egg 
Squids, eggs, and all sorts. Squid eggs, you um, never know. Next yeah, month, I may even find my ticket to the uh, Rye Harbour Discovery Centre, washing up on the beach down there. Who knows? Who knows? Yeah, but let's, um, let's see what you find, put it on the Facebook page, just uh, send it to us on social media. That'd be great. Yeah, so get out of there, guys, and start cleaning up the cleaning up the beach. And yeah, as Nikki says, let us know what you find uh, and stick it on the Facebook uh, Nature Table page. So uh, nothing you can do for thirty days wild. You, you can uh, you can join us uh, on next next month's Nature Table. I always put these these Nature Table pictures up here without actually asking anybody if they're going to be around on uh, June the tenth. So I'm not sure are you going to be around, James Barry. Are you. Uh... Yeah. Yeah. Okay. They're around. Yeah, I should perhaps run it past you first, but. Uh, um, anyway, we'll be back uh, on a 30 Days Wild special uh, on uh, uh, Thursday, June the 10th. Uh, and I'm doing a talk uh, on June the 22nd, which uh, I optimistically said will be the day we're all allowed back out and to go wherever we want and the pandemic's over. Uh, I thought, I'd, uh, as I said, I was here at the start with my Nature Diary on day one. I thought I'd be here at the end. Uh, maybe it won't be the end on June the 22nd. Who knows? But um, I'll be here anyway. So uh, if, we're, if we're back in lockdown again by June the 22nd, I'll be here. A talk for our, for our members, a tour around all the nature reserves uh, of Sussex, a very quick race round of a 30 nature reserves uh, on, on June the 22nd. So uh, that's the end of this evening's uh, webinar. So I'd like to uh, thank Barry and James and Nikki, and Alice and Ella. And if you've enjoyed this evening's talk, we always ask people if they've uh, if they've enjoyed the talk to make a, a donation to the work of the trust it only needs to be a few pounds but uh again, a lot of people watching tonight if you all put uh two three pound in we'd be very happy if you're not a member of the trust you know please consider joining us this year we've had uh some great uh some great uptake for, for new members so welcome to all our new members but if you're not a member of the trust as always always uh, always threatened that barry and i got we, we do know where you live now we have your email address because you when you signed up so uh, uh barry and i'll be coming round door-to-door uh, -door at some point uh, later in the year when we're allowed back out around the county again uh, to ask you why you haven't joined up yet because you've been enjoying you've been enjoying all these great webinars we've been uh, putting on <laughs> okay now uh, when, I, when I press stop in a minute there should be a screen there which uh, which will have some details about upcoming webinars there'll be a place for you to uh, make a donation also some details there about uh, some of the projects we've been talking about tonight and also a link there to uh, uh, to Ella's previous webinar about uh, the marine conservation zones, and a link there to the rewilding the kelp forest. So plenty of things for you to watch uh, going forward. So, uh, so thank you again to everyone uh, on the on the panel tonight, and uh, thank you again for watching. So we give us uh, give us all away, folks. There we are, and uh, we'll see you. We'll press, we'll press stop share. Let's do that. There we are. There we are. Give us all, give us all away. Thank you, everyone. Good night, folks. We'll see you next time. Take care. Cheers. Bye. 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 Bye, thanks. Bye, thank you.